Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 600, and I gotta look over here, 77. Oh my gosh, I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's July 30th, 2021. All right, welcome to another program. Before we get too far into the program, please like, share, comment, subscribe, or go to the audio podcast in the show notes of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you're here. Um, got a lot of great news, but it's still it's Casual Friday. I'm dressed down, and you're not in your uh, your garage mechanics uh, one piece suit right now, George. You got a collar on today. Well, I got to work for a living, Kevin. I'm not a millionaire like you, moving yeah. around from resort to resort. Well, we're outside of Cracker Barrel in Urbana, Urbana. It's Urbana, Illinois. We're on our way up to today to uh, Wisconsin, and uh, we'll see Mom and Dad next week, where we will go through and and uh, be the good son that I am. Mom, Changing like the program. Smoke alarm batteries. <laughs> the smoke alarm. Yeah, I, I change the batteries and the smoke alarms, the blinds. I do all the uh, the special chores. She's got a list of stuff for me to do. Do they have these skylight things that the skylight <laughs> oh, blind? That was the last condo. Yeah. And... <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, I change my. all the light bulbs that are out, and uh, once again, I'll have to rehook up her printer, which lasts for about a week uh, before it goes bazookers again. But. I'm the IT, I'm the IT son. I should be doing that. Lots of good stories this week, George. What are you up to? Today, my wife returns. I pick her up at the airport. I leave after we're done filming. Pick her up at the airport. She's been up in Pennsylvania for about two and a half weeks, helping her mother move into a an assisted living apartment. And so I got up at six thirty this morning, and the house sort of looked like the Delta House fraternity from the movie Animal House. <laughs> And so I've been, you know, getting pizza boxes bottles, everywhere, and pizza bottles. boxes, and, <laughs> and uh, I was waxing the kitchen floor, well, scraping the kitchen floor, and then waxing it. And I let the cat in when the sun comes up, and the dog chases the cat. The dog skids across the newly waxed floor; it's still wet. And so also the dog got its bath a week early because it has a lovely wax coat under its stomach. Uh, but now it's all clean and brushed and. And I'm all dressed up to pick up Susan at the airport, looking like uh, her gainfully employed husband, not the bum, uh, fixing cars in the driveway. Good. <laughs> Jill wants that too, or me. She doesn't want me to be the bum that I am. But, you know, it, you get what you're marrying into. It, it, it is what it is. Lots of stories. We're going to continue the tradition three weeks in a row now of starting our first story is a good story. And the good news story here is another uh, foreign story. Angola has grown, George. They're adding diocese left and right. Yes, we reported a week or two ago about Mozambique dividing into numerous dioceses. This week, on the 25th of July, the Bishop of Angola, Andre Sores, inaugurated the third of four new dioceses in the country of Angola. For those uh, unfamiliar with it, it's just above Southwest Africa, south of the Congo, uh, east, uh, west of Zambia. They have grown. The, we're, and Angola had been a communist country, terrible persecution of Christians. Uh, then it turned into kleptocracy with a ruling elite. Angola is entering the 21st century and it's really not the result of missionary activity that the church has grown, but the word of God is spreading person to person. And they've created uh, four dioceses, one in the Northwest, one in the, around the capital of Wanda, where Bishop Soares will be based, one in the South and one in the East of the country. The church is just, the fruit of the gospel is being harvested right now in Angola. and. They're still desperately poor. The country's going in the right direction economically. They've did socialism. Uh, but God is just doing remarkable things in the church. Yeah, well, it really is. Angola is still suffering some political uh, repression. It's, it's not fully come around yet. Uh, they still have some leftover socialism. And, uh, you know, you can't just, unless you have a revolution, 
with guns and armor and troops and uh, uh, patriots, you're not going to have uh, an instant return to normal. Uh, communism and socialism are still, I'm going to say, alive in Angola, George. It's only alive in the uh, ruling party, mm -hmm. but as a practical matter, people tried socialism and it doesn't work. And everybody knows it doesn't work, and so the ruling party basically may have its uh, uh, manifestos, but the richest woman in Angola is the daughter of the president of Angola because she runs an oil company. Mm -hmm. uh, these people have tried socialism, they're trying capitalism, they like capitalism. They do. Well, it, it, but the real point is not socialism and capitalism. They're trying Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And it is just, they love it. All right. Uh, for the umpteenth week in a row, our third story is another story from the Church of England. And uh, there's another update on Smythe. And I thought you could uh, uh, bring us up on the saga of Jonathan Smythe, George. Well, we, we've... Uh, maintain a tradition here after a good news story we have a church of england story which is almost always a bad news story and we have several this week uh, the national safeguarding team announced that uh the smythe affair will basically be made their findings will be made public next summer i don't get the next part of their statement that they uh uh could not hold a zoom meeting because of covid and therefore the covid pandemic is sort of dragging things out a bit. I thought the point of having Zoom meetings was so that you could continue to do business during COVID. But, well, it's the Church of England. It's Church so of England. Smythe, so the Smythe <laughs> Affair... The Smythe Affair may come to a conclusion, or, is this, and I hate to be cynical like this, or I think they'll perpetually kick the can down the road because too many people are going to get burned when the paper comes out. I, based on all that I've heard from victims and other people involved in the survivor community, as they call it, it's Justin Welby's going to get burned. The question we would once ask, ask, asked of Richard Nixon, what did you know and when did you know it, needs to be asked of Justin Welby, because Justin Welby has said things publicly that people privately contradict saying no he knew he knew in fact uh, we have one of our viewers who sent me an email a few weeks ago when we had a related story and uh this fellow was uh, well i don't want to give too much away in case he gets in trouble but he had direct one-to-one -one personal knowledge that welby knew when welby was in a college student uh forget oh i didn't hear out of here officially when i was a Archbishop of Canterbury, well, be known in his 20s. Unofficially. He was living in Cambridge about this stuff. Yeah. Unofficially. Unofficially. He didn't get a minute from his uh, appointment secretary on this. He was told face to face. So, I don't know what will come out of this, but I'm, I'm glad that they're actually taking this seriously, but I'm not expecting uh, them to shoot the head of the church over this. No, as you and I have discussed before, at some point, if the Church of England exists in two or three dozen years, the um, Archbishop of Canterbury at that time will be apologizing for Justin Welby's uh, sins. Because right now, Justin but, Welby but is Kevin, apologizing for other people's issues. Yes? Kevin, there is hope for the Church of England. A new prophet I has arisen. Think. There's a new star in the east. <laughs> According uh, to Rowan Williams, see, let, let me. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the uh, the quick of the uh, uh, the press release that came out. Teenage climate activist. Press release. It was my article. Frick, my article. My name's at the top. Not a press release. Come on. Oh, like Kevin. I don't read all this of your stuff. Does this, Susan read all your I, stuff? That's why I earn the big bucks <laughs> that you give me. Okay, I'm going to read the first paragraph. You do the story. Teenage climate activist Greta Thornburg, Thorn, no, Thunberg, sorry, I don't know her name, is Thunberg. a prophet. Is Dick a prophet. Thornburg, forfeiter, attorney general. <laughs> yes, is a prophet for our times, says Archbishop Canterbury, former Rowan Williams, 
what's the story here? We have a new prophet? I remember when somebody said Bono was a prophet. I remember back in the late 70s, somebody said Jimmy Carter was a prophet. Tell me about Greta being the prophet for the church. Prophet of doom, doom. Uh, for Jimmy <laughs> Carter. Oh, uh, Rod Williams was attending an ecumenical festival via Zoom that was being held in Norway. So you have a lot of earnest people in sweaters and Birkenstocks. And he was leading a Bible study on Jeremiah and the Old Testament prophets. And he was asked a question, what did he consider Greta Thunberg to be? Could she, did, was she an inheritor of the prophet's mantle? And Kevin, if you've got the article in front of you, I think the quotes, all we need to do is read the quotes. Uh, <laughs> God has raised up a prophet in Greta Thunberg in a way that no one could predict. She had said things that no one else could have said. Thank God for her. And that Greta was a very good example of a prophetic voice who, like Jeremiah, aroused the slumbering masses. Oh, Rowan Williams, you never disappoint. You never disappoint. That was nice. Oh, isn't this wonderful? <laughs> oh, why? Uh, uh, friends, I think you can sort of see that we regard Greta Thunberg as a bit of a joke. Uh, a bad joke. A whiny, well, no, I mean, obnoxious, ill-informed joke. <laughs> she's obviously ill-informed, and uh, now more and more... Uh, scientists are claiming we don't know enough about climate change, which is nice. I'm glad you finally came around. Um, but she's she's an activist. And if you want to uh, say that uh, Greta Thorn, Th Thunberg is a wonderful activist, absolutely. You know, no question about it. I would not say she's a prophet. <laughs> My opinion. Well, a prophet is not recognized in their own land, and the woke crowd recognized Greta Thunberg is a prophet, so she's what we call in the Bible a false prophet. So I think she's a wonderful example of a prophet, but a false prophet, not a true prophet of God. No, agreed. That was a fun story. We we argued in the pre-show or discussed the, the, whether or not this should be uh, our good news story, the, a new prophet for the church. Yes, that the Church of England now has something. See, this ties into a, a report we uh, published uh, on uh, the Anglican Inc. from the Civitas, that's sort of a uh, center-right think tank in England that basically said the woke policies of the leadership, the hierarchy of the Church of England are to just driving the church farther and farther and farther into the ditch. And they looked at three things in particular that the hierarchy of the Church of England had bought into without question. The notion of systemic racism, uh, critical race theory, and a climate emergency. Now, the cli I was thinking about this when you were talk we were talking about Greta because Greta is a climate emergency activist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can believe that there's man-made climate change, and if you live next to a, a steel mill, uh, you know you can see the effects that human activity has on the climate. Climate emer act emergency climate emergency people believe that unless we act today. Uh, you remember Prince Charles, uh, or was it Al Gore? One of the others Al said Gore. by tw 2020, uh, the oceans, would, New York would be, was it the New York would be underwater or all the polar bears would have drowned? Or Well, let, let, let's this, go back. Others, unless we do something today. The, the mantra of the climate emergency people, alarmist, has been for the last 50 years, we only have 12 years left. In 12 years, uh, we won't be able to turn back the, the clock and pollution will be out of control. We will have global warming. All the ice caps will melt. All the oceans will rise. Uh, there will be a cloud cover over the earth and the heat will not be able to escape. And that has been the mantra now for 50 years that we only have 12 years left. If you went to a climate activist right now, like Al Gore, and say, how long do we got left, Al Gore? He would say 12 years. You said that 12 years ago. No, it's 12 years starting now. And so, okay. <laughs> so, you know, that's the that's the, the time, George, 12 years. And you better watch your clock because in 20, what is it, 20, 34, 32? I can't do math well. 33, 2033. It's, it's all over. It'll all be done. Yeah. The, uh, the, art, the, the report finds that in that... The Church of England, in preference uh, for senior positions, is 
almost monochromely woke. In other words, people brought into uh, deaneries, archdeacons, rural deans, bishops, all subscribe to these three rather left-wing partisan political viewpoints. And because the church has so alienated the base of the English population, the Civitas report claims, these people are so isolated from real Christians and real believers from the man in the white van, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, they only reinforce what they tell each other. So not only as is the uh, Church of England failing as a prophetic voice for Christ, it's becoming a far left uh, political party. We recently saw one of these surveys that said some ungodly figure, uh, like 90% <clears throat> of the Church of England clergy backed the liberal or labor, uh, uh, liberal Democrats or the Labour Party, that they were left wing. Now, say what you might about the Episcopal Church, survey after survey after survey finds that we're roughly 50-50 Democrat Republican in the clergy and in the lay people. It's just say, the bishops who are kooks. Yeah. <laughs> but, I would say the influential churches uh, are undoubtedly more liberal, uh, and certainly the bishops. Not but influential churches, but influential people, bishops. Trinity, um, Trinity Wall Street. I wouldn't but, say that, you know, well, what, what, if people don't know, we're having a little time lag between George and I. I'll speak, and it's about at least uh, three or four seconds before he hears what crazy thing I said. So there's a little time lag in today's show. We apologize. That's AT&T's fault, not ours. Uh, well, uh, Kevin, I concede your, I concede your point uh, mm -hmm. about most of the institutions have been captured by the left. Yeah. But if you actually ask the people, the man in the pew, the woman in the pew, the average parish priest, it's roughly divided like the nation is divided. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a mirror of the nation, except we're older and whiter than the United States as a whole. Uh, quick, there's actually an interesting story out of the Church of England. Uh, we posted a story about um whether or not we can have women in ministry in the church of england without having women clergy and i thought we could talk about that real quick that's proven to be a very popular read on anglican Inc. rod thomas the bishop of maidstone is the sort of flying conservative evangelical bishop in england and in australia a conservative evangelical has a specific meaning that it does not have in the United States. And one of those is in the belief in the complementarian position uh, that works itself out that women are not to be priests, but rather women complement men in the ministry. And of course, the Church of England as a whole rejects the complementarian position, uh, women bishops, women clergy, far left, all this and that. But Rod Thomas put out a paper from the complementarian position, what effective and valued roles women can have in the Christian ministry. And I think it's a good paper. Uh, it comes from a particular point of view, but it, if you read this, you can understand where the people in Sydney are coming from, where Rod Thomas and the uh, conservative evangelicals in England are coming from. And it's from a specific biblical viewpoint. Because too often critics of, uh, of the conservative evangelicals just call them names, that they're misogynists or this and that. But there's a bona fide theological rationale which is driven from their reading of scripture, particularly Paul and uh, you know, the Gospels. So it's, it's quite a good paper. Now, uh, I'm not advocating for it or against its conclusions. But really, if you want to be informed and not just be dismissive of people who don't think like you, read Ron Thomas's paper that he had commissioned and how they're working to raise up the voice of women in the leadership and ministry of the church. Because one of the things I agree, even if I don't agree with Ron Thomas on every point, is that there's this mindset that unless you're a priest, you're a nobody. Right. And no, that's... that's one of the reasons for the decline of the Episcopal Church, it's clericalism. <laughs> now, as a layperson, I agree that a cleric is a nobody. And so, you know, I, we have a, clearly a different understanding um, in that. Now, you and I have a stated policy that we will not give our opinion 
on women's orders in the church because we don't want to gain half an audience or lose half an audience with mere words it's just it's not worth it uh, for the mission of anglican tv and anglican unscripted and anglican inc however we do want to point you to interesting discussions that happen on both sides of the, this issue and the continued discussions that happen uh, in so many provinces at the College of Bishops uh, level. And so this is a great uh, reference for some uh, source material who does take on the, the Sydney type uh, um, discussion with the Anglican, the English flair to it. And I enjoyed the read, so. See, in the United States world, in the Episcopal world, I would be called a conservative evangelical. Mm -hmm. But all, <clears throat> all an English conservative evangelical or Sydney conservative evangelical has to do is look at me and say I'm not a conservative evangelical. Why? Collar. I've got a collar on. <laughs> These are the sort of damp sweaters and wool tie types that, uh, uh, you know, dress in coat and ties. Uh, we used to have those in the United States, uh, Northern Virginia. One time Truro Parish at, uh, was uh, the clergy wore coat That's and right. ties instead of collars. This is a great uh, point for a transition we, um, uh, with our stories. Um, let's do some follow-ups. Uh, first follow-up story I want to talk about is Truro. We reported last week that they had lost their second rector in a row, and there's a bit of turmoil and uh, melees about, you know, what's the future here at Truro? We can't hold a priest. And why did he have to go? And what's going on? And was he properly investigated? And I thought we could hash this up because we've got a little bit more information now uh, as to what happened and the process and who he was to the church. So bring us up to date on Truro Church. Yeah, yeah and we want to engage with some of the comments mm -hmm. uh, on the last week's video, uh, both to show you that we read them and also uh, I think it's their fair questions to ask and it makes a better story if we can expand upon it. The criticisms of our reporting, of my reporting, uh, Kevin is squeaky clean on this one, is that uh, Mayfield, Tim Mayfield, who was the acting rector at Truro, was not given a fair shake. And it was pointed out that the Diocese of the Mid-Atlantic Canons has a reconciliation process when you become estranged from your vestry. And the thing is that Tim Mayfield was brought on board by Tory Balcom to be senior associate rector. Tory Balcom was the previous rector who in 2019 resigned uh, with, you know, with pressure from the vestry and then in 2020 entered the, was received into the Catholic Church. Tim Mayfield is still the senior associate rector, but he has been in the position of acting rector. Or interim. Now as acting, well, acting rector or sure. interim yeah. rector. But whatever it is, that adjective in front of the rector word means that the canons that govern past relationships between a rector and a parish are not applicable. He is what you would call an at-will employee. As an associate, as an assistant, he serves at the pleasure of the rector. When the rector is not there, that authority falls upon the wardens and the bishop. So people have pointed out, well, they had this examination and we don't agree with the results, but the diocese should have done this and this and this, all these steps in the reconciliation process. If Tim Mayfield were rector, yes, but he wasn't. He's acting and mm -hmm. is, could be, and so when the vestry says, we'd like you to resign, he, he can resign, but if he doesn't, he could be fired the next morning. Okay. Now next a week from sunday august 8th uh the par the wardens have promised the truro will have a parish meeting and well they'll go into the details of the allegations made by two people in february against tim mayfield now these allegations have not been proven i think we need to say that but the outside law firm who investigated reported to john guernsey the bishop of the mid-atlantic that they were more credible than not. Mm -hmm. And again, these are all the standards for an associate or an assistant or an interim or an acting. Yeah. If it's a rector, you have more legal protections. So, and sometimes you have a contract. There, and there are many people yeah. at Truro, yeah, and there are many people at Truro who think this just stinks, it was unfair. 
but there is no evidence that the bishop and the wardens did not follow things by the book. People may not like the decisions they reached, but I can't see any truth to the assertion that they did this high-handedly or without reference to the canons and procedures in the employee handbook. Now, most weeks you and I wake up on a Wednesday morning or a Friday morning and we're very unpopular. There is a person who's more unpopular than us right now, and that's Pope Francis. Pope Francis has decided that um, the traditional Latin Mass is not as big a deal and should not be as big a deal to the Roman Catholic Church as it is now and has decided for all intents and purposes that it's not going to be the standard unless the bishop makes it the standard and it's not going to be something uh, that uh, you are in cart allowed to do. You got to seek your bishop's permission, as I understand it. George and I have opined on this and those people who love the Latin Mass very, very much have written to us in emails and comments explaining at a higher level what we don't understand what what we're missing here with the traditional latin mass i speak no words of latin george i did not take it in high school or college uh i if you put a latin word in front of me i could probably make it out not so i am not an expert on the traditional latin mass i've heard it three times i think once in the exorcist so that's four times in, in my entire life it worked in the exorcist so clearly the latin mass has you know a, a a great tradition behind it but to those people who've commented on it what are we missing george well i suffered through latin starting in about fourth or fifth grade and i the nightmares of a mo a mas, a mat, uh conjugating verbs and oh and well the roman catholics don't pronounce Latin properly like, like we at Episcopalians do, so I think it's all a waste of time anyway. I'm being silly friends, I'm sorry. Uh, but we do pronounce Latin differently, uh, and it's an unintelligible at times between the two groups. We, I'll speak for myself, but I think Kevin would also be in this line. We approach this issue from an Anglican perspective, an Anglican lens. As and does so Pope Francis. When Pope Francis gave local up, and when Pope Francis essentially gave what we saw, or I saw, as a purely Anglican option, answer, I'm sorry, answer, which essentially was local option, it didn't seem unreal or wrong to me. However, people who know this stuff from within the Catholic Church have come back hitting hard, uh, sort of along the line of, if you remember the old Saturday Night Live uh, de uh, Dan, Ac uh, Dan Aykroyd would respond to Jane Curtin on uh, Jane, you ignorant slut. Uh, George, you ignorant slut. Uh, you got it all wrong. The, 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 the Francis is uh, basically promoting heresy. Uh, he is destroying the soul of the Catholic liturgical and worship system. And when you destroy worship, you destroy one's relationship with the divine. I'm speaking other people's words at this point, but friends, I want you to educate me because I hear, I read the words that you're saying, but I still don't get the force of the argument of why a local option is wrong. Yes, you could have bad bishops. As an Episcopalian, let me tell you about bad bishops. Uh, but I just don't see where the temperature, the heat is coming from on this. So. Get, go to the comments, tell me why I'm wrong, don't call me an ignorant slut, but uh, basically explain to this poor, poorly educated Anglican why Francis's words and actions are the beginning of the end of Catholicism. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand tradition. Tradition is very heavy in the uh, Anglican Church and certainly the Roman Catholic Church, and I understand comfort with the liturgy, um, but uh, I don't understand kind of the arguments that are going back and forth here. And please go to the comments section and, and fill us in. All right, next update. Uh, we opined last week about some of the confusion uh, between, uh, let's see here, 
the jurisdiction of the armed forces chaplaincy as to their jurisdiction where they uh, belonged. Uh, we opined that there was confusion within the jurisdiction and outside the jurisdiction. I just had a wonderful comment or comment phone call with uh, Derek Jones where we discussed you know the history of the chaplaincy um, going way back before the ACNA, way back into the uh, uh, days of uh, uh, Kena, Nigeria, and stuff like that. And we agree that outside of uh, the jurisdiction, there's much uh, misunderstanding about where Derek Jones and who his archbishop is. And he says his archbishop is uh, Nigerian but he is a full partnership with the ACNA and takes much of his um, uh, marching orders from Archbishop Foley Beach. If there's a higher uh, question into, uh, into take into account, he does refer to his Archbishop in Nigeria. As we've uh, posted on uh, the Anglican Inc. website, we have a statement from the chaplaincy uh, task force that they're trying to work out the minute details of the relationship and from people i've spoken to the desire is to have the chaplaincy the the anglican chaplains move fully into the acna um they have a lot to do to do that one of them is to work on canon 11 to allow a space where a jurisdiction can become a diocese and you know we had a great conversation we had lots of things that uh, uh derek and i agree on so um it was, it's been a, a week of news george with the, this task force yeah um looking delving more deeply into this um we in and again responding to comments there were some very strong comments uh, uh you know one one or two people asserted uh that Kevin and I were seeking to destroy the chaplains, and that we were agents of the devil, and this and that. Well, we usually get that sort of thing. That, but that's that's in Chuck. Case, that no, that we're takes not us, agents of the devil. That takes us back to Chuck Murphy days, and some of those people who said that, I'm like, I, did it? You you were a Mia. You were, so I I see. Yeah, I mean, know. they they're they're waiting for their opportunity to to bet their bile. Um, so essentially, yes. Uh, the problem is, is that when the ACNA was formed and it was handed over oral, it was hand, the chaplaincy was handed over orally, mm -hmm. verbally, by Nicholas Ako to Bob Duncan. The paperwork that, never and, got turned in. And that's my understanding as well, is that Bob Duncan and Oko had, had an agreement um, and there was just never a follow through. And the chaplaincy says, you know, because there's no paperwork documenting that we are ACNA, there was never a follow through, there's never a place made for us. We are still under Cana. We're still under uh, the Church of Nigeria. And we have a partnership with Kanan, the uh, um, Cana group out of Houston. And, you know, we look forward to the day that we can um, have a documented. Uh, ecclesial agreement with the ACNA, and Derek Jones laid that out perfectly, and I agree with that. So, you know, the um, the some of the confusion has come where Bishop Jones has explained this to some of his clergy, and it was taken away by some clergy to mean we're leaving Agna, going back to Nigeria. And they did not hear, or perhaps it was not conveyed to their understanding that we've never left Nigeria, but we're acting under ACNA. And Wait, okay. then the well, hold on. CONAM... Wait, you, it, stop right there. That's confusing. That's, that's, it, it, when, you, when you, if you just say that to anybody in the College of Bishops or anybody, uh, you know, outside the, the, the inside politics of uh, what happens in the Anglican Communion, what you just said there is very confusing. Yes, my archbishop is Nigerian. I get my marching orders from the ACNA because of a partnership. And uh, a we're honoring, I mean, some uh, 
policy from before. That's confusing, George. And and also, um, examples of the acting fact is that the two suffragans Derek Jones has were elected and approved by the College of Bishops of Acna, not by the Church of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, the canonical residence in the minds of most, if not all, of the JAFC clergy are Agna. Now, here's some of the, 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 the things that further confuse it. Uh, Bishop Jones also serves as the accreditation or authorization uh, bishop for some non acna Anglican entities in the United States. So they act on behalf of other uh, groups in the Anglican world who are not part of the ACNA. And if you look on the website of the Church of Nigeria uh, North American Mission, uh, Bishop Felix Orgy uh, uh, basically states that Bishop Jones and the jurisdiction are belong to him. Well, they belong to him in the sense that he's the inheritor of what used to be portions of Cana. But at the same time, they also belong, if you will, to Julian Dobbs, who is the other. Well, uh, yeah. it, it's like it's like in the it's like in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Yeah. You have both the Episcopal and the Anglican diocese, both tracing their lineage back to the same people before the split. Um, but, uh, well, that's but a bad I, analogy because it's just going to cause grief. I did ask Derek about that. I said, you know, on this website, Felix kind of claims you as his. He says, no, I have the same uh, level of authority. I'm the same bishop uh, as Felix. I report to my Ni Nigerian archbishop. I do not report to Felix. You know, he, he made that very clear that um, it, it, I said it would be very helpful if we could really redefine the word partnership that you guys are all using. He says, yes, we'll work on that because partnership means so many different things to all these provinces around the world as to the ecclesial relationship within a partnership. And I think it would behoove everybody, including Kevin and George, if we could make those uh, relationships more known. Yeah, so, so first off, where's things going? Bill Atwood is uh, Foley Beach is head of the uh, oversight committee, or I forget the exact for, words for it. Uh, the can the committee chartered under Canon Nine of the existing Act uh, Constitution. Canada. North American Chancellor Task Force. Yes, and Bill is the ACNA's fireman. Wherever there's a fire, they send Bill, and he puts it out, and everything gets fine. So this is going to basically get straightened out. Mm -hmm. The lawyers have to get to work and basically transfer the title, ecclesial title, titles. And also for the people who are so quick to take anger and assume and assign malice. Uh, to be frank, the only malice I have is to critical race theory. Uh, got, we got it into this program, Kevin. Uh, we got it in. We got it in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <sighs> but no, I have we have no malice against these people. I mean, uh, I've always had a very good relationship with Bishop Jones. Bishop Jones wrote to me, he says, George, you're basically, Bishop Jones was afraid that I was uh, being duped by people who were trying to do down the chaplaincy program. Mm -hmm. And that is different, and that may very well be so. It, I am a dupe on many occasions. Uh, I you remain an Episcopal priest, and I'm quite happy. Yeah, but, in fact, it would be unfair. The, it would be unfair, George, for uh, people to talk to our wives about you know our what we're confused about. <laughs> but, but, but I think it's so easy to assign malice when you disagree with somebody, mm -hmm. um, and that's not the right way to go through life, folks. It just is, especially in the life of the church. Look for the best in people. You know, they're always, you can come, I've got five, six hundred people in my church. If you went through the, the directory, you could probably find a good dozen or two who can't stand me, but are waiting for me to die. And then you'll find four or five hundred who think I'm a great guy. It's the same with any bishop and his clergy. You're going to find people who think the bishop is a jackass. And then you're going to find people who love him. But what's sad 
is when you, and this is what we saw with the Chuck Murphy affair. Gosh, Kevin, how long ago was that? 10 years? Yeah. It was right after the foundation well, of... Well, the Chuck uh, Murphy affair... You see me? Yeah. The Chuck Murphy affair, you have these people doing the My Bishop Right or Wrong routine whose allegiance was not to Christ, but was to a man and an institution. And when you start going that, down that road, folks, basically you're not being a real Christian. You're being a fanatic. And... You know, you know, I don't think that represents the majority of the comments. I think, you know, three or four people went berserk and that's, you know, please be more respectful in, in, in your comments. Uh, Kevin and George have no malice towards uh, the Anglican Chaplaincy. In fact, and what uh, we're wrong. we find it a very vibrant part of the ACNA. Uh, but d I, listen, to what I listen to what I just said. I said we find it a very part of the ACNA. Well, I kind of like it to fall under the ACNA and all ecclesiastical authority. That's my point. So. Well, it's the other thing I think people, uh, we read the comments and we want to respond to those that are intelligent and in good faith. Mm -hmm. I get drawn into sometimes wanting to respond and then I say something and then I almost always delete it because I don't find it profitable to be engaged in a uh, shouting match on the internet. And I try, and because my own credo is to seek the best in all things and all people. And if I assume malign thoughts in others, then I'm not living up to my own standard. Hmm. But, uh, well, sure. hey, but great, let's, uh, folks, great let's, let's, not, let's not be like the AMIA guys. Let's be like the Church of Angola. Well, happy, yeah, sure. growing. Yeah. Life is tough but we are still in it for Christ. I want to correct that a little bit there. I, we don't want to be like the AMIA leadership at the time. That That's where the, the real problem yes, was. you're right, yeah, the, the laity and many of the clergy t were nothing but respectful and talked to us on the side and said, we don't know why they're doing this. We don't know why you're a target. We don't know why you became the news of the news story. Um, they're not like this. Okay, I hope not. All right, but it kind of looks like they're like this. George, let's finish off today's episode talking about the Diocese of the Upper Midwest, which I am currently in, the Diocese of the <laughs> Upper Midwest. Um, what's the latest news, and do we have any hope in the future here? Archbishop Beach has appointed two Episcopal visitors. Hmm. One is Todd Atkinson, who is, I think, the tallest ACNA. Bishop. He's uh, up in uh, Charlie Masters' territory. He's from Lethbridge, I think in Alberta. And John Miller, who is down, who lives down in Vero Beach, Florida. Uh, they will basically exercise Episcopal jurisdiction in the interim while this process unfolds. We've been talking to people, uh, insiders and public commentators, clergy. Uh, we've been reading. I've not spoken to the abuse victim the one on the internet, but I've been reading all that she's written. And I'm not calling anybody out on this, but things are so diametrically opposed that I'm going to let the, the, the law courts, the criminal law courts, and the ecclesiastical process work itself out So and basically set down the facts because Apart from the fact that the sun will come up tomorrow, there's nothing anybody agrees about in this uh, story. Well, but that's just it. I mean, we get to a point where if everything that's posted on the internet about the accusations and what happened is true, this is a horrible story. If 50% were true, this is a horrible story. If, if any of it is true, this is horrible. And that's where we have, as press, and we as uh, people on social media, and we as uh, interested people in the future of the church have to step back and let the process work. You know, the allegations here are horrible and need to be investigated, need to be looked into, need to be prayed over, and need to be put into a third party who can unemotionally look at what is being said, what is accused, and what uh, the church should do about it. Uh, you know, the accusations here, Kevin and George, are horrid. I have two daughters. George has two daughters. We may be a little biased on one side of this because of our desire to protect 
uh, what is extremely precious to us. And so we need to step back emotionally and let this be investigated by professionals who are not Kevin and George. My uh, disquiet about this is not only do I not have the full facts, hmm. but it's also about the uh, use that this story is being driven uh, by people whose agendas and motives are different. Yeah. For instance, there was on, on Twitter, there's a, an, act, uh, an actor priest named, I think he's a priest, E B B E, who is uh, basically uh, making accusations that the province and the diocese haven't been transparent and forthcoming. And he, he had a comment the church, the diocese, the church is run by Bishop Stuart Rock, who recently chaired a sexuality and gender task force. That has made some headlines for releasing a statement pol pol policing the language gay Christians use to describe themselves, i.e., don't say a gay before Christian. And this whole argument is in the sense that uh, this is payback uh, for Ruck being the leader in the uh, pushback against the gay Christians. Well, Ruck wasn't the leader, it was Foley Beach. It was, uh, just name just went out of my head, Kevin. REC. Uh, Sutton, Ray Sutton. Ray Sutton, Ray Sutton. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Bishop That's Sutton. Right. <laughs> uh, well, and, hey, and, hey. Creeping dementia is getting me. <laughs> but, you know, but when you have clergy going onto social media doing this stuff, this is what Martin Minns was writing about last week uh, about don't do this. Don't make aspersions. Don't try to connect dots that will only lead people to. To make horrific accusations, you let, and, God, let the system play out. If you don't trust the system, reform the system, but don't change it midway through the game. Yeah. You and I have been reporting on the church, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Catholic, uh, Ang the Anglican Church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church for decades. Okay, and there's no diocese that's pure in this. There's no diocese that's not had their scandals. There's no diocese who's not done things wrong and learn later to follow the process. I fear for a diocese who always says, I am so glad we're not these guys, because when your uh, sexual misconduct uh, hits the internet, what's gonna happen? You know, it, it, when you're, and I'm gonna use your words, when your karma uh, hits the internet, what, what's gonna happen? Nobody's gonna be there to, to, to protect you. Nobody's gonna stand up and um, wanna protect you. We are brothers and sisters in faith. We need to be praying for each other and praying for the victims and praying that at the end of the day, at the end of each day, that Christ is glorified. And I don't see that from uh, a couple of dioceses that, you know, I, I'm getting ready to name names. Yeah, I don't know, George. It, it, it's extremely frustrating uh, to see people. You have a seminary education. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, so I, I, enough, enough, enough. George, we well, we Kevin, end from Kevin, yeah. Kevin. You're a ni you're a nicer guy than I am. Mm. You're a nicer guy than I am. Uh, I'm. Uh, you also control the edit button, so if I name names, you can take them out. <laughs> so bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> All right. So let, you know, are we ready to close? The show? There, once again, there's a two second gap between when I say what you hear. Uh, are we ready to close the show, George? Do you want to hear about a corruption story from India? Or we did that, that last couple? week. We did that last week. No. This has been the Friday well, edition. A new one. <laughs> this has been the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And you've been watching episode six seven seven. And I'm George Conger. <laughs>